make it go. Hi. <laughs> okay, we're all Hello. Back. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. Uh, apologies for the short notice on the time change. I have in between travel right now and ah, forgot to set the event. Uh, so thank you, you guys, for coming. Uh, please, you can do us a favor by tweeting the event, uh, sharing it on Google+, Plus, Facebook, all the places uh, so we can share this out. And if you are catching this late because uh, I didn't post the time change, I apologize. I hope you enjoy the recorded version as well. Uh, I am uh, one of your hosts, Nicole Gallucci. I'm a postdoc with the CosmoQuest project. Uh, my co-host for the wall is George Bracey. Hello. <laughs> and uh, we have a special guest with us today, Libby Norcross. Hello. Hello, <laughs> hey. Hello Libby. So uh, as usual, you guys can interact with us using the Q&A app anywhere you're watching this video embedded or on YouTube, or on Google+, if you're watching this live, you can click Join the Conversation Live on the video, and it'll take you to the Q&A app. I see Nancy Graziano has already joined us. Hi, Nancy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I imagine everybody else will come later and be sad that I didn't <laughs> set the time earlier. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, sorry about that. Okay. Um, it's it's also, still there um, later. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we have a comment from Guido Bibra. He's going to have to watch the recording later. Hi, Guido. Sorry about that. Um, and comments from Michael Jobin as well. Hello, who will sadly not be at Convergence this weekend. Uh, Hello. So I'm in between trips right now. Um, yeah. Myself and the programmers and Tiny Intern went to Maker Fair Kansas City last weekend, which was super awesome. And we wanted to make all the things. <laughs> and. Um, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, yeah, I still have an yeah, office. Chance to catch up at all, yeah. Nope, nope, I still have an office full of things. <laughs> and then I'm going to Convergence uh, for uh, the sci-fi convention as well as um, uh, the the embedded Skepticons. There will be lots of science and skeptical programming there as well. So if you're in the Minneapolis area, check it out. If you come to Convergence, check out our panels. It'll be good times. Um, that, I think, is all the business we have to start with. Uh, Guido wants somebody to say hello from me on the Q&A. It looks like Google has removed the option to post on the mobile version again. Sad face. So I see you're coming, Guido. Hi, everybody. Guido says hi. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so we have with us Libby Norcross, who's waving hi at Guido. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at the Challenger Learning Center in Normal, Illinois. So thank you for joining us. You have the most excellent... Um, Background, background, and yes, <laughs> and outfit, and outfit. Yeah. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the Challenger Learning Center? Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the Challenger Learning Center and and what you do there? Sure. So um, I am a flight director at the Challenger Learning Center in Normal, Illinois, which is right in the heart of the state, right in the middle of the state. Um, and we are one of close to 50 centers uh, around the world in the Challenger Learning Center network. Um, Challenger Learning Center was founded by the family members of the astronauts who perished in the 1986 Challenger shuttle accident. Um, there was Krista McAuliffe, the first teacher in space on that crew, and so the family members, uh, instead of making a plaque or building a statue, decided that they were going to continue the educational mission of the crew and build Challenger Learning Center. Um, so, yeah, what I do here, primarily we run simulated space missions for kids in the middle school grades. And we do a plethora of other programs as well, but that's why I have the schnazzy flight suit. In fact, when I was offered this job four years ago, um, I told my friends, hey, I was offered a job at a space simulator, and they were like, oh, that's cool, and I said I would get to wear a flight suit. And every time they would say, you said yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. It's amazing, yeah. So what kinds of, um, what is the program like for students when they come for a, a flight simulation? Yeah, so um, here at our Challenger Center, we have, uh, our space simulator is one room that is mission control. It has banks of computers, uh, monitors up front. We have one room that is, oh, pardon me for just a moment, I'm sorry. One room that is a space station. 
Um, and so it has science stations and computers around the room. We have a briefing room. We have a spaceship. And so uh, primarily we have school classes, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. And when their teacher signs up for a mission, we give them this training material. And each of the kids in the class uh, applies for a special team during the mission. They might be the medical team or the probe team or the space weather team. And uh, for a few weeks before coming to Challenger Center, they train with special curriculum for their team. Um, and then when they get there, get here, we have a two and a half hour mission experience where the teams work together to voyage to Mars or rendezvous with the comet. So a flight director like me would give them their mission briefing in our briefing room, uh, and then students would split up. Half of them would go to the space station, half would go to mission control. Uh, they would work through part of the mission, and they would get a chance to switch places and experience the other side as we finish the mission. And so it's science and it's math the way it's used in the real world, not just like homework problems. But it's also those good 21st century skills, problem solving. Uh, we have emergencies and missions, um, communication, teamwork, and stuff like that. So even in two and a half hours sometimes, we really see some kids' confidence go from, what is this, to, I can do this. So it's a really fun and rewarding program. Cool. I also want to point out we got a hello from Robert Sparks in the <laughs> Q&A. <laughs> Hey, Rob. <laughs> Who was our guest last week on Learning Space. Hey. Hello, hello. So, Libby, uh -huh. do the teachers get to participate at all in the missions, or is it just for the students when they come? Um, when teachers sign up, they come to a teacher training workshop where they get to fly a mission. But when their students come, we tell the teachers that they are ambassadors from foreign nations and they can't speak English, so they can't <laughs> help their kids because this is all about the kids. This is their mission. Uh, we run programs for adults and we run training missions and stuff, so adults can do that. But when a school comes, no <laughs> grown-ups. <laughs> <laughs> but the teachers have had a chance to kind of experience it too then beforehand. which Yeah, is they love, a lot of schools love to bring lots of parent chaperones or sometimes they'll bring their principal so that they can walk around and experience it too and some uh -huh. of the parents are so funny, they really want to use those robot arms and they really want to put their hands in that glove box and you have to tell them, remember you're a dignitary from a foreign nation. <laughs> That is so cool. Yeah, back when, oh gosh, I was um, actually during my master's program in physics, part of one class I took was um, about teaching astronomy. And so as part of that, we actually took a little trip uh, across the river here to the St. Louis Challenger Learning Center, um, which was really amazing. And that was just so much fun fun to get in there and just try all the different things, all the, the high tech, and you really you can just imagine yourself actually in mission control and or on the space station because it looks so cool. Not only are the things you're doing really cool, but it really looks like you're there and it's just you can just imagine it and, and have so much fun. So I went with a group of adults and we had a blast doing that. And, yeah, and um, St. Louis has a beautiful facility, but all the Challenger right. Centers, it's that immersion, that kind of learning that comes out when you are actually in the mission that you just you can't beat. Yep, yep. And it's all those things involved. It's like you said, it's communication, it's problem solving because you just, you know, you have an idea of what the mission is, but then the unexpected happens. You never know what you're going to have to deal with. And uh -huh. you really have to have that team that pulls together. So it's an amazing experience. And I love screaming about oxygen emergencies and stuff. <laughs> I get to be a, it didn't say on the resume that you needed to be a drama queen to be good at this job, but you totally do. <laughs> I bet it helps. So what kind of training did you have to go through as to, you know, be the flight director for this? Well, Were you familiar with any of that kind of thing before, you know, you started to work there? That's a that's kind of a, a funny question, actually. This Challenger Learning Center used to be located on the other side of town, really close to my house, and I had no idea it existed. Mm -hmm. um, my, my background is science and teaching. I have associates in science degree. I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education. Uh, I wanted to be a math teacher or a science teacher. Um, uh, when I graduated from school, the, the teaching job situation was not great. So this job, I saw it post, and it said you had to like science and technology, and you had to have a teaching degree. So I thought, oh, this will be fun. Um, so I applied, and I did get the job. And when I was here for my job interview, they gave me a tour. And I was looking at the curriculum, and I realized during my student teaching, 
I spent a few months in a fifth grade classroom that was training for a field trip to Challenger Center. Um, and I had created these lessons for these kids and trained everybody for their mission. And then I didn't actually get to go on the field trip. So I didn't realize that I had applied for a job at the place where I was training kids to get ready. Wow. So um, I was familiar with some of the curriculum. Uh, when I got the job, then I had my teaching in science background. My background, uh, I've been working with kids since... I was in junior high, um, and then, of course, I got to have some of the training in the environment itself. I was mm -hmm. lucky to get hired at the end of the summer when it was kind of quiet, so I got to sit down at every single team station and kind of go through the curriculum myself. Um, I observed my director giving some missions a few times, and then uh, it was time for me to start running missions by myself. Right. And Actually, I have some funny stories about my first mission, but, yeah, it, it was a, a cool training process. I want to hear stories. I know. Okay. Stories. <laughs> okay. So, uh, probably my favorite story about when I was learning. First, uh, I was trained to work in mission control as the flight director. That's the somewhat easier job. And then, when I kind of had mastered that, I was trained to run the mission as the mission commander in the space station. They kind of pull all the strings and everything. Um, and in our our setup, we have um, the briefing room has this big red push button. Shoo, sliding door that you go through like an airlock, you go down a hallway, there's two more sets of sliding doors and then you're in the space station. Um, in case of an emergency, the space station has just a big back door that takes you out to a hallway, kids can use the bathroom or whatever. Um, and so sometimes during missions, um, our college president likes to take uh, foundation members and board members on tours. We're situated on the campus of the community college and so we love showing it off. And typically, they come in through that back door of the space station. It doesn't disturb anybody, you know, while anything's going on. Um, but my very first time flying solo as the mission commander, um, we were having an oxygen emergency, and red lights were, you know, going around, and every, sirens were screaming, and I was hollering at kids. We had three minutes of oxygen remaining, and the college president had decided to give a tour, unbeknownst to us, and instead of using the back door, here I am freaking out with this emergency, and the airlock door shoo, slides open, and two men in suits come in the door, and the kids are freaking out, the airlock's open, we're sitting in, we're all going to die, and I had to be like, please, the airlock door, and we had to take care of this whole oxygen emergency, and then, you know, the, the college president thought it was very amusing, and we had them exit through the back door, but of course, he chose this day to come through the airlock tunnel <laughs> instead of the back door, so the kids thought that it was his fault we were having an oxygen emergency. Yeah. Mission. I was like, okay, if this is my first time as mission commander, it can only go up for me here. <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sure you dealt with that little unexpected thing very well. So. Oh, I loved it. We have stuff go down all the time. There was a time uh, in the space station, half of our computers just died in the middle of the mission. Mm -hmm. And so I'm running around, opening up consoles, replugging, unplugging, flipping switches, and this boy with the headset kind of leans over his computer and he goes, oh, you're testing us, aren't you? This is just a test. You're seeing if we can handle a challenge. And I was like, Yep, yep, that's exactly what we're doing. And he's like, this is genius. He just thought it was the greatest thing ever that their computers were down. I was like, yep, you, you caught us. Busted. All part of the program, right. So, you know, we roll with whatever happens. It's a really, it's a fun job. It's the same. I've done close to 700 missions, and it's the same script, the same program, but it's never the same mission twice. Wow. Yeah. Do you guys randomly insert problems or is it kind of a, supposed to go according to plan? Um, there are some emergencies that are embedded. Um, if students are doing really well, they will uncover them. And there are some emergencies that we can just throw in there at any time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael Jobin comments, at Convergence, a bud and I had two PCs with final approach in the science room for congoers. I'm not sure what that is. Sorry, Michael. I'm not sure what that is. Final approach. Is that like a... I don't know what that is either, but... Hi, Michael. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Okay, let us know what that is. Hi, just... I was okay. at Maker Fair just this weekend. There was a spaceship simulator. It was more based on the Enterprise than the space shuttle oh. than what they had kids doing, doing mock missions. I would be okay with that, too. My uh, co-worker in the office next to me is a huge Trekkie, and I'm a Star Wars fan. 
So we run this uh, April Fool's wacky mission every year where we wear <laughs> Star Trek costumes and we use the Force to save the probe and stuff like that. that so so much fun. That would be it so is so fun. fun. And so. Uh, Robert Robert Sparks uh, adds improv rule: incorporate the unexpected into science. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> you would know. <laughs> you would know. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so what kinds of what does the curriculum for the students entail? Like, how does how can because this sounds like really awesome and fun, but how can teachers sell this in in the current climate where everything is standards based? Uh, yeah. Um, we are actually the cool thing is we're working on updating our curriculum right now to line up with uh, next generation science standards. Those are coming down the pipe. Uh, I did a workshop on NGSS just this spring for our local teachers. So. As far as teachers getting uh, involved with the curriculum, we do teacher training workshops all the time. Well, a few times a year mm -hmm. that um, are great for that. And um, not all challenger centers have the same curriculum offerings, but uh, back before I was hired, our center received a grant that wrote specific uh, lessons that tie into some of our older standards um, and a lot of um, cross discipline, you know, English and math, science things, and so there's lessons about reading a graduated cylinder, and pH, and vocabulary of space terms, and just kind of a whole bunch of things that uh, teachers can pick from to fit in with what they're already doing in the classroom, which is really nice, so. And you mentioned and the 21st all... century skills, which are really important, and they're embedded in new standards, you know, in one way or another, so the, the communication um, cooperation, working together, problem solving, it's all all really good stuff. Yeah, and those sometimes those soft skills are hard to quantify, but mm -hmm. you really see it at Challenger Center. It's mm -hmm. very a very cool environment for that. Yeah. I wonder if you notice a difference between your younger so it's like fifth grade maybe the youngest that you would take versus, you know, eighth graders. Um, when you look at how they especially react to the emergencies and sort of work together as a team, you know, do you notice differences between the younger and older? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, actually, my favorite are the fifth and sixth graders, because some of them still think it's real, <laughs> so <laughs> they get really engaged. Uh, by the time, like, we run with eighth grade, sometimes they go, oh yeah, this is a fake comic, you know, and they'll, some kids will get really into it anyway, they'll, they'll use the skills. Yeah. Um, but the fifth and sixth graders that think it's real, they're like, this is life and death, we need to pull together. <laughs> so. <laughs> Pretty so cool. So what kinds of events are open to the public in addition to the school programs? Um, we, our website, challengerlearningcenter.com, we would sometimes list uh, events that come up. We do sometimes open houses. Um, last September, I know we had a first Friday theme going on. Uh, I appear at the large, large um, science fair at Illinois State University every April Family Science Day. And we also run public missions that we put out. At, again, we're on the campus of a community college, so they have their community education program booklet that they mail out to everybody. And so, for example, we run, um, around Valentine's Day, we run a mission for couples called Fly Your Sweetie to the Moon. <laughs> we have a lasagna dinner and a moon shake cake and we launch two sweetheart probes to the moon, you know, and so <laughs> programs like that would be advertised on our website and um, in the community ed catalog as well. Cool. So is there a listing of all the Challenger Centers all over the place? Yeah, um, the, the parent, the kind of headquarters of our organization, their website is challenger.org. Um, and so you can read about the history, the national staff. Um, you know, I'm going to bring up that page. I didn't and, know it was international, actually. Yeah, we have uh, an opportunity maybe to go visit some of the <laughs> other centers. We no. have um, one in England, one in South Korea. They're looking at some other countries. We also have Canada and Hawaii, and so I've tried to make the case a couple times that our network needs a flight director exchange program, and I will volunteer to exchange with Hawaii. <laughs> yes. That would be a cool program, really. Yeah, and it, they're all 
they all have space station, they all have mission control, but um, they're each very unique. Some are uh, standalone facilities, the one in Woodstock, Illinois, um, the one in Tallahassee, Florida has an IMAX theater and a large area with exhibits. Our center is a little bit smaller where we are. Um, the one in Seattle is associated with the Museum of Flight and they get to um, they're part of the Planetary Resources Arcid Space Telescope. Oh. Uh, when they had that Kickstarter about this time last year, there were shots from the Challenger Learning Center at the Seattle Museum of Flight. And so they, there are some, just the people that work at Challenger Center are really creative and really innovative, and all the centers just do the coolest, coolest things. It is so fun to be a part of Challenger Center. Oh, sweet. So they all have a different flavor depending on probably where they are, and what other institutions are there and that they're connected to. So exactly. go and visit different ones to, to yeah, get Yeah, whenever I travel, if I'm close to a Challenger Center, I make a point of going to see it. So yeah. I've seen um, a, quite a few of the ones in our network now. Awesome. And so um, do you guys update your missions and things according to like current events? Do you try to bring you know, because the space program, you know, changes and develops and new discoveries are made and there's always something happening out there. So um, is there room uh, for you guys to suggest, yeah, let's bring in this new discovery and, you know, kind of modify the mission and throw that in there? Sure. So um, the, the missions, we run two missions at our center, uh, Voyage to Mars and Rendezvous with the Comet. Those are developed by the National Network, mm -hmm. um, and so all the centers get kind of the same basic skeleton for those programs. Um, some of them will sometimes tweak those missions that they run, because part of our job here is historical. We remember the crew. We rendezvous with the Comet because that's what the Challenger crew was doing. Um, but we're also forward-facing. Our spaceship in our center, for example, is not a space shuttle. We tell the kids it's a future spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And um, we've developed some other programs, science summer camps, some um, presentations and things on the side that relate to future space. I'm a complete space geek outside of my job, so I'm always talking about whatever I just read, you know, even in a mission briefing with kids, I'll say, last year, Hubble Space Telescope discovered an object with six tails, and they'll go, oh, you know, whatever I was reading at the time. Um, and the Challenger Center headquarters is developing new programs as well, so they're actually uh, in process of some things and looking at some exciting future programs. Um, there's a Challenger Center in uh, Richmond, Virginia at their Math Science Innovation Center that does some really, really cool stuff. And they were talking about maybe doing a program that has to do with the asteroid recovery mission, the ARM mission. So Challenger Centers are definitely staying plugged into what's upcoming while they still, you know, remember and showcase our history. Yeah, definitely. So I see there's also a team building for employers <laughs> have have uh, have employers taken advantage of that? And and if so, what is that that like? They have, yeah. We're one of a few centers that offers what we call corporate missions, um, and we have had a quite a few of them here. And so, it's a cool environment because it's unlike what anybody's used to. So you can have company president and company janitor on the same footing. Mm -hmm. um, and we usually focus on communication and team building. And in this simulator environment, when there's flashing lights and sirens and emergencies, you know, old habits rise to the top. And so what we do is they'll say, oh, this is a place for kids. This is a piece of cake. I got this. Um, but we start off by talking to them about communication styles, kind of prep them for the mission. And then um, for students, they have binders full of directions that are very detailed, very helpful. Um, for uh, uh, the corporate adult missions, they don't get that. Mm. They get flimsy little binders with kind of vague directions in them that are in this kind of old typeface, like the old checklists of mission control. Um, and if a student has a question in a mission, a flight director such as myself would be there to go help them out. If a grown-up in a corporate mission has a question, Tough rocks. They need to figure it out. So we uh, we put them through the first half of a mission, and stuff happens. Stuff goes right. Stuff goes wrong. And then we pull them out, and then we we kind of take a break, and we say, okay, what happened? What challenges did you face? Oh, you are waiting forever for an uh, email of data from your teammate. Does that ever happen to you in the work world? How about that? Um, so we pull out all these parallels to the work world, and then. 
Uh, we make a plan, we make a communication plan, and then we go back into the mission and finish and hopefully do better than we did the first time. Um, and then at the end of the mission, we pull them out, we talk again about what happened and you know how this relates to the experiences that they've had before. Um, and so what's been really cool is we've, uh, and then last year, there's a nuclear power plant in a nearby town, and they have been sending us a lot of corporate missions. And mm -hmm. these are usually primarily male or all-male crews, and a lot of them have military experience, and so the communication aspect is very different. It's not kind of floundering around like other groups will do. They're like, status update, update, everybody stops, everybody listens, three-point communication, it's done, they go back to their task, you know, and so the kind of things that you get to pull out with those groups are very different than what you do with a group who is a bunch of desk job people, but it's a, really, it's a fun program. Well, that must be fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a nuclear power plant um, could legitimately have an emergency situation. <laughs> they totally do. And so when we have the emergency sirens for them, a lot of times they don't even bat an eye. <laughs> They're like, okay, what do we need to do? <laughs> Whereas other groups would be like, oh my gosh, what's wrong? Uh, we had a one of my first years of working here, I was working in mission control for a corporate mission, and we have an emergency where the space station um, gets impacted by micrometeoroid debris, so there are these sounds, pew, 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 where it's hitting the hole, and this guy in mission control scooches out of his chair, jumps up and screams, oh my god, the Klingons are firing on us, we've got to get away. <laughs> He's into it. <laughs> Those people make these so fun. We always say, oh, there's a candidate for the comedy mission. Come back in April. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Don't panic. It's just Klingons. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have to, like, learn to keep a straight face in the face of, you know, some of the most hilarious things. Oh, my gosh. Good. You know, you guys are really actors. We really are. And I didn't anticipate that when I applied for the job, but it's one of my favorite parts now. Do you have any improv or acting experience, or did you really like learn that on the job? I'm just a dramatic person. <laughs> just a natural. <laughs> it's so good. good for teaching. About, oh, yeah. You talked some about your, your education background. What, um, what first got you into space and science um, and, and education? So when I was probably about middle school age, this was like before Google was a big deal, mm -hmm. um, and it was so cool that we had Encarta Encyclopedia on CD. Oh my gosh! Mm -hmm. And uh, we also had Compton's. It was like 1995 edition. And on Compton's was a, a game called like Star Quest or Starfinder, where you were in a spaceship and your job was to locate certain constellations and then zoom in and find certain. Um, you know, messier objects and stuff like that. And I was obsessed with that game. And um, I was homeschooled, and so one of our projects for Solar System was to make these giant planets out of foam core and color them in, and then we stuck them to the wall of our, you know, schoolroom and stuff. And I just remember having such a good time laying on the floor of the basement, coloring in Jupiter, and I thought, our planets are so weird. Our solar system is so weird. And the weird, wonderful solar system, I, I thought that was great. But then that love of space went dormant. And I, I started to love other things. I loved reading. I loved math. I got to college and realized how much I loved chemistry. So I was going to be a chemistry major in school. And I was going to be a math teacher. Calculus was like the funnest of all the maths, you know, and um, stuff like that. And my freshman year of college, I got a job tutoring students there because I needed to make some money. It was a part-time job. And from my working with kids and my time tutoring and teaching at that job, I realized I love learning and I love helping other people learn. So I thought, okay, maybe education. Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of by some some real providence, I actually was able to change my program, uh, go to Illinois State University and get into their elementary education program, which is kind of hard to get into. Mm -hmm. uh, I got into this senior year project called Professional Development Schools, which only lets a very small number of people in, and so I figured, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I, you know, I, I'm a nerd. I like science. I like that. And then space wasn't necessarily my first love until I had to apply for this job because I needed a job and there were no teaching jobs and I thought well this is cool and uh, it was a few months into this job I started to go 
okay, I really, really like this. And then my family took a vacation to Kansas, and we went to the Kansas Cosmosphere, mm -hmm. um, which is a big space museum. They've got the Apollo 13 capsule. And I think that trip was really where the switch just flipped on for me. And I was like, I love space. And then uh, that fall, I, um, uh, over Twitter, applied to go to a NASA tweet-up. It was a tweet-up at the time. And I got to visit a NASA facility. And then I started to get involved with the Space Geek community online. And it just kind of whew, whew, snowballed. And it was like Pandora's box had opened. And now I'm completely obsessed with outer space. So, wow. <laughs> That was kind of a long answer, but it kind of just threads through my whole life until it explodes. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to hear how people get to where they are today, and it's always, almost always, much more interesting than you would think. It's just, you know, especially when the paths do kind of curve around and go to all these sort of interesting places, and so that's a wonderful journey, and it sounds like you found your, your place. I like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> So are there ways people can help the Challenger Center, um, either yours in particular or, or, or the, the main organization? Is it run by donations? Is it? Uh... Yeah, donations is definitely a big part. If you go to challenger.org, they've got the big Donate Now, and most of the Challenger Centers, if you go to our websites, will have a Donate Now button on there. Um, some Challenger Centers take volunteers, too, so if you find that there's one near you, um, different centers will use volunteers differently. Um, some challenger centers need part-time flight directors. We would love to get a new part-time flight director. Some are staffed almost entirely by part-timers, so if you're near a challenger center and you're like, I want to do this, <laughs> totally check them out. Um, there's Some centers have jobs like education coordinators, media outreach, depending on the size of the center and what they do. So if it's something people are interested in, donate is a huge way to help. Getting the word out, of course, is always great for us because we've been in our community for 10 years and there are still people who have no idea that we exist. We're kind of like the best kept secret wherever we are. Um, but then, yeah, volunteering and even maybe working part-time is really cool for us. Yeah. Do you ever go out to schools at all? Or at least stay, do you stay in touch with the teachers or the classrooms that come and go through the missions? Is there any like follow-up or contact after it all takes place and then it's all done? Yeah, our center does. We stay in touch with teachers. We send them emails about special programs. Um, we're looking at um, maybe creating some post-mission curriculum, maybe a, whoa, take a look at the picture of the comet your class discovered or whatever that we can follow up with. But we do some school visits. Uh, we, I, this morning, actually, just went to a daycare and did a spacesuit presentation. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at creating a, a distance learning program for our center where we can Skype into classrooms of very young students because I've done that a few times for a school uh, out I think in the Missouri area where I Skype into their kindergarten class and answer questions about space for a while you know and so we'd like to get into the classroom more or at least you know Skype get ourselves into the classroom I know some challenger centers have distance learning missions and stuff like that too which is pretty cool so we're happy to reach as many people as we can yeah and then Nicole, you've Skyped in, right? To, <laughs> weren't you an astronomer that Skyped into a class? I Skyped into the school where my mom is a secretary. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, your daughter does what? Will she Skype with my classroom? Okay. <laughs> right, but especially the little guys, they're probably just as impressed, almost as impressed by that as if you were there in person, in a way. Oh, like, yeah. Cool, it's coming over the computer. But it, it sounds like actually being at the center and, and being able to take part in a mission is like the ultimate experience. Oh, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Cool, cool. Um, I wanted to, like I mentioned before we started, ask you about some of the artwork you do on the side because I follow you on um, must, what, uh, Instagram. That's the name of it. <laughs> <laughs> and some of your... Um, your doodles as well as your your space uh, inspired art. Do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Yeah, I would love to. Um, uh, 
Well, space was something that I haven't loved my whole life and then found out I loved. Um, creating is something I have loved my whole life. I've always been an artsy kid and I did knitting and crocheting and painting and drawing and all those things. In fact, uh, these banners behind me are covering office walls that are like floor to ceiling with photography and art, most of it that I've taken or that I've made. Um, and most of it is, of course, space themed as well. So. Um, what you are probably referring to is my my doodles, right? My hand art, hand lettering. Hand art, yeah, but also the um, the sneakers and the space art that you do. <laughs> yes. So a couple of years ago, I started um, drawing quotes uh, with a sharpie, um, and I have a, a Tumblr page called Consider This Thought, and I run pictures of those posters on my Instagram account at Libby Doodle all the time. Um, and in the last year, especially, I've branched out to not just drawing posters on paper. I've designed some wall clings, I've done some t shirts, and um, I for a NASA event back in March, I took two white canvas sneakers from Target, real cheap, and I drew Sharpie. Um, of space missions and space quotes and rockets and things like that all over the shoes so that I'd have some cool space shoes that I could uh, wear to the event as well. Um, and it was pretty funny because some people saw those at the event, some press people, and said, we may have to contact you about designing some space shoes for our crew. So They were amazing. They were really, I, I, I don't know, do you have a picture handy of those? Um, they're on my, do you want me to bring it up? Um, oh, or you can tell me where to look, and I can I can search for it. Uh, if you go to considerthisthought.tumblr.com, it's going to be a few pages in, but there is a picture of the shoes on there. Okay. I did not know you had a Tumblr, but I'm following you now, so yay. Oh, thank you. Yeah, okay. actually, the Tumblr is where I, I kind of started. Um, okay. uh, I'm writing about my journey as an artist right now, and... Uh, I, the quotes that I started drawing, that was just a social experiment, actually, and it was only supposed to be a week, <clears throat> a week long, but people started inboxing me, don't stop, this is just what I needed to hear, keep going, and so I thought, okay, and so I quietly kind of started uploading these posters to that Tumblr page uh, for about a year, and I thought, this is it. And then uh, I became involved with some other things and some people who encouraged me to take my art to the next level. So the Tumblr page wasn't it, but it's kind of where that started. Wow. Okay, this is not the same one, but I love this one as well. See if I can. So as you're bringing that up, I will say, um, sometimes kids come into our doors and they think you can be artsy or you can be sciencey. Yeah. You know, you can love English or you can love math. And, um, oh yeah, one by Jen Shear. Jen Shear! <laughs> Fabulous founder of Space Tweet Society. Yeah. Um, and so, when I get a chance, sometimes I'll tell kids about my art um, to say that you can be artistic and sciencey because really, science takes creativity. And mm -hmm. art is like speaking another language. And so, last week here, we ran a summer camp called Rocket Girls that was for 4th through 8th grade girls. And it was a whole bunch of uh, making and engineering projects. And we had some special speakers. And a number of our speakers said the same thing to the girls. They said, look, I'm artistic too, and I am a planetary geologist. Or I used to think that I couldn't be um, an English person because I'm an aerospace engineer. But it really, you can be both. You should be both. You know, And it only makes you better to be both. So I love that. I tell kids that all the time, but I'm local. It was great to hear, like, Women at NASA telling our kids the same thing. Well, I, I, I didn't realize that until grad school. Um, I started dancing in grad school, and at one point, the student ballet dance troupe at University of Virginia was primarily science and engineering graduate students. <laughs> <For> <laughs> it was real? like that clear awesome. we all needed that creative outlet as something very different. Right, from something did. that's yeah different from the everyday thing you have to do. Yeah. Okay, these are the sneakers that I made Uber Squee over because I saw the pictures as you were like putting them to get, like as it was coming together, like the stages of it. So there's is that Curiosity? Oh wait, mm -hmm. Curiosity and Voyager and Saturn and oh, that's a Saturn Five. That's SLS on the front. Oh okay, SLS. There's a shuttle. There's James Webb on the back. <laughs> like nice, yeah. So great. I just love the one with the stars. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a, a tiny blue earth in that starry background, the pale blue dot, but you can hardly see it. This one? 
don't know if yeah. it's pointing. Cool. You can see. No, that's all. Oh, I see it. <laughs> I think I see it. Yeah, you totally do. It's a little surprise <laughs> for nerds like me. That's fantastic. That is so adorable. Oh. Um, there's a Tumblr called Startorialist that uh, you should submit that to. Uh, it's a couple of astronomers, um, mostly based in New York, but uh, they are getting, they are collecting pictures of uh, either everyday people wearing space-themed things or the, the dorky things astronomers wear, like when we're all at conferences together. So I think you should submit that because that's fantastic. <laughs> oh, I totally will. Yeah. I've got some galaxy pants I could wear with those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody's got the galaxy <laughs> leggings now. <laughs> Are you thinking of moving beyond shoes, maybe, and trying some other, I don't know, stylish space designs? I would love to. Most of the stuff, the really new stuff I do is actually comes from people who hire me and they say, hey, would you do a t-shirt or would you do a poster for my band? And then I'm like, I never would have thought to try that. But the shoes, I actually, my, my name, Libby Doodle, my small business Libby Doodle, came from when I was in college working at that tutoring job. There was a guy who worked the front desk who liked to give me nicknames. And I used to sit at the desk and I would draw paisleys and I doodled on a pair of shoes for a friend and I had I was working on those during some downtime. He's like, I'm gonna call you Libby Doodle. And it's stuck. <laughs> nice. And it's stuck. Oh, I have a comment from Nancy Graziano who uh, this is about the connecting um, arts and, and, and science. She has a BS in electrical engineering and she's been a technical writer for 25 years. Perfect blend of English and STEM. Yeah! You go, woman! <laughs> <laughs> That's our friend Nancy, who's in New Jersey. Um, trying to think, is there anything else about the Challenger Center that you want to share with people, um, particularly educators or people with kids? Um, uh, I think Challenger Center, people hear about our missions and they think that that's all that we do. Mm -hmm. But I would encourage people to check out the other programs that their Challenger Centers have. I mean, some of them are larger and you can just walk in and they maybe have museum areas. Ours is smaller and not like that, but there are fantastic you know, Boy Scout troop activities, birthday parties, um, science summer camps, as I mentioned. We have those for incoming kindergarten all the way through eighth grade. And so there are really opportunities for anybody who wants to experience Challenger Center to get involved. So I'd say totally check it out. I think we're pretty cool. I'm a little biased, though. <laughs> you must have a lot of homeschool groups, I imagine. You mentioned you were homeschooled, right? And that do you have a lot of those groups come into? Uh, we have some. We actually would like to expand our outreach to the homeschool community. Yeah. I just noticed you have some games on the site as well. On the side of what? On um, sorry, the Challenger Learning Center under uh, four students, there are a pair of flash games. You have Space Invaders and oh, yeah. Flash Zoids. So anybody watching can go play that now. <laughs> I forgot those were on there. Well, we're getting ready to update our website uh, in, in the next year here, and so I'll have to add some new space games to that repertoire. Games. Yeah. I know Purple Space Program, I am really hoping we can start to incorporate that here, but I haven't played it yet, because I know once I start, it will suck me into a black hole. <laughs> So for three years, my Space Geek friends have been saying, you've got to check it out. And they released, you know, the NASA and educational elements not too long ago. And it looks like it would be so great for our center. But I have to wait until we have time to do it because I will just be gone once I get started with Kerbal. So they got me started with Kerbal at the end of our 32-hour fundraiser hangout. Oh, I that. So it was a sleep-deprived me. <laughs> Trying to learn, although um, our, our lead programmer, Corey, already had some, some experience with it, so he could kind of talk me through the first bits, you know, because the first few times you do it, it's just a horrible mess. They at least got me to figure out how to launch with, with, with without too much trouble. Um, thankfully, I was sleep-deprived enough that I haven't gotten addicted since, but I feel like if I, if I get into it, I will also get completely addicted, and... <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I we I had a kid come through Challenger not long ago, and he goes, 
oh yeah, Kerbal. Everything I know about orbital mechanics I learned from Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> That's an XKCD comic as well. <laughs> <laughs> because of course. <sighs> but, 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 but Challenger Learning Center is like Kerbal in real life. Only <laughs> you don't blow up. <laughs> I was going to say, only we don't blow up. <laughs> we don't blow That's up. a good thing. Uh, do you ever think the spaceship's going to blow up sometimes? But, or there was um, my, my first time observing my boss as mission commander. She has the kids in the space station, and she's giving directions. And we have this uh, red door that says technical access. And it's how we get behind the space station to fix computers. But this boy raises his hand while she's talking. He points to the door, kind of scared. He goes, what's that? And she says, it's technical access. And he goes, are there escape pods back there? And she's like, yep. And he goes, are we going to need those? And she just, without skipping a beat, she looks at him and goes, you tell me. <laughs> and he's like, oh. So he was done. He did his job for the rest of the day just fine. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. Mm -hmm. so. Do you hear from the students later, um, I don't know, thank yous or just, you know, to get a sense of, like, what they're, you know, what they really liked or what they learned or... Sometimes no, we'll get, oh, now I want to learn more about astronomy, or now I want to be an astronaut. Do you have lots of kids that, you know, now that's their thing, and they're going to go be astronauts? There are kids that will say that at the end of the mission. Uh, we do a post-brief wrap-up where we encourage them to keep learning, and sometimes kids will say, now I want to be an astronaut or an engineer. Um, sometimes we'll get um, thank you cards in the mail from classes after their mission. Sometimes I will run into kids just while I'm out running errands, you know, and um, they remember me. I had a girl run up to me and go, you remember me? I'm going, sure. And she goes, you know, Miss W's class. <laughs> right, how is Miss W doing? You know, and she's like, oh, yeah, we did this science thing after our mission, and it was so cool. Mm -hmm. um, I personally don't know if we track to see if any of our kids, you know, join the Air Force or anything <laughs> after like that. I'd sure love to know. I think there was one student who became an Air Force pilot, and he told his teacher later it was because of his experience at Challenger Learning Center. So we, we do <laughs> have that impact on people. We just can't track it like I want us to. Yeah, it's yeah. really hard. It's really hard to track. But, but you make an impression, absolutely. That's so fantastic. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for coming on the show and telling us all about Challenger Learning Center. I really want to go across the river and visit ours in St. Louis now. <laughs> they're, oh, they're an awesome site, and they have a we'll great trip out to you, because why not? Yeah. Cool. Tell them, tell them I said hi, too. Some totally. of like, their director will probably remember me, and some of their other staff totally know who I am. Cool. <laughs> awesome. A bunch of announcements hangout-wise for us. Mm -hmm. Um... So right now, we have Astronomy Cast and Weekly Space Hangout on summer hiatus, as uh, Fraser is busy with doing all kinds of different projects right now. Um, Virtual Star Party is moving to a monthly format, but I don't know when the next episode is going to be. I have to kind of bug them and see what that is like. Um, but I can tell you that the next Learning Space will be next week at a regular time. Um, we'll be talking with Anita Hayward about science journalism and communication. Ooh. And two weeks from today, we have a, um, both Georgia and I will be traveling. So I want to do some kind of pre-recorded activity. Uh, I am currently open to suggestions. Uh, <laughs> can, <laughs> last year we did a couple of episodes this way. I did some shorts, uh, films myself doing, uh, some little science activities through Google Glass, which is very convenient because I can run around the lab and pick things up that I need. <laughs> so if you have any suggestions, email them to educate at cosmoquest.org or ping us on Twitter or Google Plus and say, hey, I want to see this on Learning Space. Since I think um, two weeks from now and then again in August, we'll also have a pre-recorded one. You and should tour your Challenger Center with Google Glass on. Ooh, that's a good one. Google let me? I'll have to ask them. <laughs> and it's a free advertising. That sounds awesome. Okay, we will, I will have to look into that for, for the August one. Awesome! Um, and also, I forgot to say, Michael Jobin said, good to see you, Georgia. So, Georgia, welcome back. <laughs> you have a very busy know, time. Just Do you want to tell everybody what you've been working like on? Years, years, yeah. Good to be back. We want to tell everybody what you've been working on the past couple of weeks because it's a really big project and really awesome. Oh, I know. Some teacher professional development, um, and you mentioned, and it was focused on the new standards, which are really um, 
complex and you can just get into those and you feel like, wow, it's, it's just, um, there's so much to think about when you're looking at aligning curriculum and aligning lessons and units with the standards. So we were diving into that. Um, but we also did some really cool field trips around um, the city, around the area. And actually, those teachers have been to the Challenger Center, so they all thought it was an awesome time. So, yeah, that was fun. So congratulations for a very successful two-week-long professional development. Yeah, I know. Right, that was two weeks. Right? It's weird to be, it's weird to be away. Yes. <laughs> and good to be back. back. Yeah. All right, and Libby, thank you so, so much for coming on the show and talking about Challenger Learning Center um, and, and all your work. So I will be including links to your Challenger Learning Center to challenger.org, and I'm going to include a link to your Tumblr, if that's okay, in our show notes. Hey, <laughs> so no cool. problem. Thank awesome. you. So people can check out check out all your work. I'll include it in the um, event description, which will then go into the show notes on YouTube and on 365 Days of Astronomy. So, yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for watching, for commenting, uh, for questions, and we'll see you next week on Learning Space. Woohoo! Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Libby. Great to Thank you. you so much. This All was right. fun. Bye bye.